In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. When I was a new priest serving my first church in Texas, there was a food truck along my route to the church that served all kinds of delicious breakfast tacos. Many mornings I would stop and wait in line for two potato and egg tacos made with homemade tortillas and this green salsa that was so hot it would make my eyelids sweat. (laughs) The taco truck was an unfortunate blessing, though, because even though the tacos were delicious, I'm still trying to lose the pounds I packed on back then. Well, when I moved to Alabama a couple of years later, I had to give up breakfast tacos sold out of a truck. That just wasn't a thing in Birmingham in 2005. So I waited, knowing that the power of the breakfast taco would eventually make its way east. (laughs) It took a while, but you can now find decent breakfast tacos in Alabama. And now I have no reason to return to Texas. Oh, okay, I do have a son in college there, so I guess I'll have to go back. Well, I love that food has the power to transcend cultural barriers, especially when you consider how culturally defined our eating habits are. Often we aren't even aware of all the rules that surround what we eat and when we eat it. When I was on a mission trip to Honduras, we ate beans for breakfast every day. That's just what they do there. Though this was strange to me, I had to ask myself why I think it's normal to eat bacon and eggs. Why not hot dogs, for example? Well, because everyone knows that even though a hot dog is a sausage, it's the wrong kind of sausage to eat for breakfast. But if you just wait a few hours, it will be the right kind of sausage to eat for lunch. So to sum up, if you want to be a normal American, you have to eat the right sausages at the right time of day. Well, when you stop to think about it, every culture has some pretty arbitrary rules, both spoken and unspoken. Keep this in mind the next time you read Leviticus. My point is that we are not that different from the people to whom Paul was writing the letter to the Ephesians. We also live in a multicultural and religiously pluralistic society. The question becomes, what do we do with that reality? Do we approach difference as a threat to be eliminated or as a blessing to be enjoyed? It's human nature to notice differences and similarities. It's human nature to put things into categories, even people. Suppose I told you, for example, that Billy is a 40-year-old white electrician from Reform, Alabama. Well, you now know some things about Billy, but you don't really know Billy. Your mind will try to fill in details about him, details which may or may not be true, because people don't fit neatly into categories, and no one wants to be pigeonholed or stereotyped. That being said, we do find security and identity in belonging to a group. We all want to fit in. Perhaps there is something in our basic survival instincts that makes us want to associate with people like us and which makes us fearful of those who are different. That guy who eats a hot dog for lunch at 11 o'clock, he's a good guy. But that guy who eats a hot dog at 1030, well, he's weird. We better keep an eye on him. But fearing those simply because they are different is problematic for a number of reasons. First of all, when we're afraid, we tend to think in dualistic ways. There are no shades of gray. It's either black or white, right or wrong, for or against. Dualistic thinking is overly simplistic. It's the winner-take-all mentality, and it short-circuits creativity in a desire to get to a quick fix. It divides the world into us and them, and in our worst moments, human beings can classify them as something less than human to justify all kinds of terrible things. I think we're seeing this kind of thinking in our polarized political climate these days, and as a result, it's become very hard for our leaders to find common ground to solve real-world problems. So there's a lot of anger and frustration in the public discourse. The Bible reminds us that this is not a new problem. In the time of Jesus, the dualistic mindset was just as strong In his society, people were divided into Jews and Gentiles. Jews were the people of the covenant, and Gentiles were everybody else. The Greeks had their own system of classification. If you weren't a Greek, then you were labeled a barbarian. In the time of Jesus and Paul, separation was the key. Jews were forbidden to associate with Gentiles. 
to enter a Gentile home made you ritually unclean. Even the architecture of the temple reflected this division. There was a wall separating the court of the Gentiles from the inner courts of the temple where Jews could enter to worship. No Gentile was permitted to pass through that wall. Walking right into the middle of this division comes the Apostle Paul, a Jewish man, a Pharisee even, who has the gall to proclaim that Christ has broken down the dividing wall that separated Jews from Gentiles, that in Christ there is no longer Jew or Gentile, there's no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female. Now you might imagine not everyone was eager to accept this message. In our passage from the letter to the Ephesians this morning, Paul addresses the division between Gentiles and Jews head on. He's writing to a young Christian community in an important city in Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. The church in Ephesus was made up of Christians from a Gentile background, and Paul tells them that at one time they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Even so, he tells them, Christ's death and resurrection have made one new humanity in place of the two. He tells the Ephesians that they are no longer strangers and aliens. They are now citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. By his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus has brought peace and reconciliation with God to all people. In Christ, all those categories we depend on and all the hierarchies that we build on those categories no longer matter. There is now one humanity and one household of God. Paul got it 2,000 years ago, but we are still struggling. Maybe that means that we all have to go on the same spiritual journey that Paul went on, because if you remember, Paul wasn't always so enlightened. He was a zealous persecutor of Christians. And then he experienced transformation as a result of an encounter with the risen Christ. Without God's help, we can't expect to overcome our natural tendency to cling to our tribe and make enemies of those who are different. We have to draw on our higher calling in Christ. We have to look to his example and realize that Jesus approached everyone with compassion. As we read in the gospel today, when the crowds of people surrounded him and he couldn't even get a moment alone, he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He showed compassion to men and women, Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, saints and sinners. And to the people who crucified him, he even prayed, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. That's pretty amazing. We can, of course, admire Jesus for his boundless compassion, but he actually asks for something more from us. He asks that we become like him, that we seek to grow in in compassion ourselves. We do that by spending time with Christ in prayer and in service to others. We all need some form of contemplative practice in which we get our egos out of the way and let God's love work on us. I came across a prayer practice several years ago that can help you grow in compassion. It's called the Just Like Me Meditation You can find different versions of the meditation online, but here's an excerpt from one version by a spiritual teacher named Ram Das. He invites us to bring to mind someone for whom you would like to have more compassion, maybe somebody you work with or a member of your family, especially someone you think of as an adversary. And then you're to say, this person has a body and a mind just like me. This person has feelings, emotions, and thoughts just like me. This person has felt unworthy or inadequate just like me. This person worries and is frightened sometimes just like me. This person will die just like me. This person wishes to be free from pain and suffering just like me. This person wishes to be safe and healthy just like me. This person wishes to be happy, just like me. This person wishes to be loved, just like me. 
A practice like, th- like this helps us realize that compassion is above all about seeing the humanity in another person. It's about accepting God's love and forgiveness for ourselves so that we can then offer it to someone else. The world is in great need of the compassion of Christ. At times it seems that humanity is hell-bent on its own destruction. The attempt on former President Trump's life eight days ago was just another traumatic reminder of how much hatred, division, and dis-ease there is just beneath the surface in these troubled times. But humanity also has the capacity to do great good when we are motivated by compassion and when we work together across our differences for the common good. These small acts of forgiveness, acceptance, and reconciliation rarely make the news, but they happen all the time. I want to live in the kind of world that Jesus envisions, what he calls the kingdom of God, the world as it could be. In this world, compassion motivates us to live in peace and harmony with each other while celebrating our differences. In this world, we are one human family, members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. May we, by our prayers and actions, do our small part to make God's dream a reality. Amen.